You know, I, I've been saved over 47 years, and we've sung that hymn uh, many, many times through the years. I don't know how many times, but I know it's had to have been hundreds, and I wouldn't be surprised if we probably sung that a thousand times through all the times I've been saved, all the years I've been saved. I'll tell you something, it's never gotten old. It's never gotten old. Amen? Praise the Lord for the opportunity to sing unto the Lord. Amen. Again, and I want to just say thank you to the guys. Uh, it is just so good to sing with them. It's just so good to go to men's prayer and, and sing with one another. I'm looking at Brother Jordan. It's such a blessing. And Brother Leo, what a blessing, huh? It's just like, how many guys have said that is just the highlight of our week? And a big part of that is to sing some hymns and we open up the word and then we get to pray with one another. It's such a blessing. All right, what a blessing again. Brother Summerdorf, thank you for being a blessing to us. I'm going to turn things over to you. Love you. Pastor, love you as well. Amen. And good evening, church family. Good to see you this evening. A blessing to have all of you here. And I um, would say that uh, the, the guys sounded really good tonight. Did you, did you notice that? That was a blessing. You know, the first time they sang, though, our RV was parked next to the modular. And uh, when I came back out after the prayer time, I said, hey, hon, we had a great time. She said, what were you guys doing in there? I said, why? Well, I said, we prayed, but we also practiced singing. She said, I thought that's what it was. I said, why? She said, the dog started barking as soon as they started singing. <laughs> Amen. The dog didn't bark right now. I want you to know that. And besides, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, and we're commanded to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Y'all sounded good. Keep in mind, if you sounded really good tonight, I didn't sing with you tonight. I was singing with you in the modular, so I may have been the problem. I may have been the problem. But I want to say thanks for coming, a special thank you to Grant for being here, also Miss Cindy, and that's all I'll say because nobody likes to get embarrassed, but a blessing to have a couple of visitors amongst us as well, and we appreciate you being here. Real quickly, I want to go ahead, and I want to read a thank you note. This thank you is from the Summerdorfs, and normally we read them or, or we'll mail them, but because of the high cost of diesel, we save the stamp and we just read the little sucker instead, all right? So... Uh, we call that sequestration, evangelistically speaking. Dear Dr. Garcia and church family, Dr. Garcia, a quick note to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your fall revival services and your God and country services to worship and serve the Lord together and to see what he's accomplishing in your midst. Many, many thanks for your kind care of us throughout our stay from the vehicle you so graciously provided as well as the RV hookups. To the wonderful meals afforded us, the sweet fellowship that accompanied them, such a delight to our hearts. Thank you in advance for the love gift bestowed upon us. As we have experienced in the past, we know it will be more than we deserve. We can only hope that somehow we have been as great a blessing to all of you as you have been to us. Already looking forward to our next time together. Until then, may you continue faithful to your king, for he is coming again soon. All our love and gratitude, Brother Dave and Miss Deb, our ministry verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. P.S. So missed seeing you, Sister Sharon. I don't know if she's tuned in right now, but we're praying special for you. Also, don't forget, you are what you eat. Amen? You are what you eat, and by the grace of God, may you suffer well. Amen? Pastor, you come on and just give you a few things here, and then we'll get into the preaching. Of course, we'll get you a prayer card. I do want to mention 9-11 special to us as well because we traveled America with a Corvette, a military vet that honors all the 9-11 victims by name. All their names are under the hood. And then all the troops who died in Iraq, Afghanistan are on the trunk of the car, 6,318, all alphabetized. And uh, that vehicle was donated three years ago today to the America on Wheels Museum in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So if you ever get up there, it's there an hour and a half from Ground Zero, one direction, a little over an hour and a half to Shanksville, where Flight 93 splashed down in the other direction. So it's continually uh, 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 a memorial that draws attention to that day, but more than that, gives the gospel and shows people how to go ahead and be saved uh, and spend eternity with the Lord. So uh, very special. If you want to see it, just grab a prayer card, a newsletter, go to our website, pictures on there, all kinds of stuff. There's the thank you card, brother. Sorry about that. 
just throwing it at you. And then I'm going to gift you because some of the folks wanted to be sure maybe uh, you need one of the handouts or outlines from prior sermons. There's a, there's a set there. And then um, I'll give you this next. All right. This is a very unique um, audio CD. Our oldest daughter, Kimberly, is almost a concert pianist. And then she married someone who's about a concert violinist. So when those two play music together, wow. Well, they went and put together a little CD called Ivory and Strings. And they were just playing around. It wasn't done in studio, but it's almost studio quality. And it, this is the music you put on late at night just as you're winding the day down. And they just talk to you through the violin and through the piano. So we want you to have that. And then every family here tonight gets one of those as well, all right? Just as a thank you for being here, all right? So we won't chase you down, but you need to say that. My wife will have it. You need to come up to her and say, hey, can I have that? May I have that complimentary music CD, all right? And so be sure to see your limited one per family. And if you meet somebody that said, hey, we heard there was a free CD given out Wednesday night. What can we do to get that? Just tell them you should have been here Wednesday night. All right? All right? So that's just the way it works. This is for Miss Sharon. $50 gift card to Olive Garden or um, Longhorn Cheddars. It's Darden Property. And is she watching right now? Okay. Here's how this works, sis. There's a rope attached. All right? First of all, no children or grandchildren can go with you. Only one adult of your choice. So don't cash this in very soon. He'll behave for a long time, all right? <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. You behave. Love you. Love you, too. Let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Slip your hand up if you'd like an outline if you didn't get one and or a pen. This is a little thought that I did share something very similar to this two years ago, but so appropriate to come back and visit it one more time, and I want to move the thought ahead even further. 2 Peter chapter 3. It's near the end of your Bible. We've been in First and Second Peter, two rich epistles. The Spirit of God through Peter has given us over the, over the centuries. And, and uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, hold your finger there and then go back to John chapter 14. So hold your finger in 2 Peter 3 and go back to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus Christ gives his disciples a promise. And by extension, if you're saved tonight, this promise is to you as well. Listen to this incredible promise almost 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ made to every one of us who belong to him. In John 14 and verse number 1, he says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Isn't that good? You know, tonight, could I remind you, it's just not enough to believe in God. James tells us the devil, devils believe also and tremble. It's Jesus Christ who's the neck in the funnel. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth and the life. Amen? Amen? And if you have the Son, you have the Father automatically. Notice he says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And listen to this promise in verse 3 of John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be be also. Could I say tonight, according to that verse, he is coming, he is coming, he is coming, Jesus Christ is coming again as he promised. But go to 2 Peter 3 and look at the response that many will have in the last days. Look at what's said in verse number 3 of 2 Peter 3. He says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Could we say it this way? Mockers. And what are, they, what are they doing? They're walking after their own lusts, and they're making fun of the following thought and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Look in verse 8. The Lord responds to the, the mockers who are making fun of the idea that Jesus is coming again. 
He says in verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. I think it's worthy to just pause and say this. Time means absolutely nothing to a God who is eternal. It means nothing to him. A thousand years, is a, the, to him it's just a day. And then look at this in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here's the Lord's response to the mockers and scoffers. In verse 10, he says this, but the day of the Lord will come. But the day of the Lord will come. And when that occurs, time will be no more. And I want to preach to you tonight three short little thoughts concerning the last lap of time. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for this honor and privilege to be in your house and with your people. Thank you for the visitors you sent to us tonight and uh, Lord entrusted to us. And I pray that for all of us tonight already, our hearts have been lifted up by song and fellowship and prayers. Lord, I pray tonight now through the preaching and teaching of your word that your son will be exalted in our midst. May it truly be all about him. And if there's one among us who's never made peace with you, through the blood of Calvary, your Lamb, the Lamb of God, may tonight be the night their faith finds a resting place in Jesus Christ alone. And for each of us that are saved, when we hear that cry, ready or not, here he comes, Lord, may we be able to say with all of our might, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Bless tonight in the thought, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The inevitable conclusion in First and Second Peter is simply this. The day of the Lord will come, and then time will be no more. Three truths I want to tell you or share with you tonight concerning the last lap of time. Number one, write this in your notes. I believe from everything I see in Scripture that you and I are living in the last lap of time. Write that down. You and I are living in the last lap of time. What do I mean by that? These days are different. They're not like they've always been. There are indicators in place right now that would tell you the return of Jesus Christ is very, very near. I wrote a few down if you want to just look at them. We're not going to look the verses up. But number one, you'll find in Daniel chapter 12 and verse number four, there's a technological indicator in place right now that's never been there before that would tell you you're living in the last lap of time. Number two, in 2 Timothy 3, you will find a moral and spiritual indicator in place right now, 20 signs and 20 sins that will be in place when Jesus Christ returns that would tell you, that indicator would tell you we're living in the last lap of time. Number three, I find a political and prophetic indicator Contained in the Word of God that would tell you you're living in the last lap of time. It's in Ezekiel and Daniel. It's in Ezekiel 37 and Zechariah. There's many verses. But God has always had a prophetic stopwatch. And the prophetic stopwatch has been the nation of Israel. You know, if you study this out, you'll find that in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14... You see, when Jesus Christ returns, that's Old Testament. That's the Tanakh. The Jewish people have this truth that their Messiah will touch down on the Mount of Olives and cleave it asunder. You visit Israel today, you don't even have to visit it. Many of you have seen the pictures of the Mount of Olives. It's just absolutely peppered with, with, uh, with graves. Uh, thousands of them on the Mount of Olives. The Jew that has any amount of money can actually bury their loved one on the Mount of Olives. And what's the attraction? They know that's where Messiah is going to touch down and they want to be first in resurrection. It's exactly why they plant them there. So the Jew knows their Messiah is going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. We know in the New Testament Jesus left and he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Amen? And he's going to meet in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 the Jewish nation 
that's gathered in unbelief. In fact, when he touches down the Mount of Olives, the Jewish people will say, where'd you get your wounds in your hands? And he'll say, at the household of my friends. And in a day, the Jewish people will see Jesus was their Messiah and they'll be saved. You read in Matthew where it says, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. That's the moment it's talking about. The Jew that makes it through the Holocaust of the tribulation period meets Messiah on the other side. And as a nation, they get saved. It's the closest thing to irresistible grace you'll ever find. But in A.D. 70, God's prophetic stopwatch stopped. The Jewish people were thrown out of their land by Titus, the Roman general. And suddenly the temple burned to the ground, not one stone left upon another as Jesus prophesied. You can still see of there 250-ton boulders, one on top of another. We've climbed through them years ago. And God stopped his prophetic stopwatch. One century, two, three, ten centuries come and go. The Jew is not in her land anymore. That's a land without her people, a people without her land. But God said when Jesus comes back, they'd be there. 1100, 1200, 13, 1492. What happened there? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Amen. I mean, but the Jew still isn't in her land to meet Messiah. They're scattered to the Gentile nations, 15, 16, 17. But on May 14th, 1948, a little flag goes up a flagpole. A hatikvah, the Jewish national anthem, is sounded. And a nation is reborn again, worshiping the same God, reading their same Bible, singing their same songs, coming back to the land of their fathers. It's never happened before or since in the 6,000 years history of culture of mankind. And at that moment, the stopwatch started again, ticking off the final years before Messiah comes down and touches the Mount of Olives. Don't tell me it's same old, same old. Don't tell me it's been like this for thousands of years and it'll be centuries more before Jesus comes. The Jews in her land gathered in unbelief as a single nation being prepared to meet her Messiah. We are living in the last lap of time. But fourthly, look in Revelation 13. I want you to look at this and we'll go to our second point. In Revelation chapter 13, we see an economic indicator that would tell every one of us tonight we're living in the last lap of time. Look at what's said in Revelation 13, verse 16. Here in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist has come to power. This is yet to happen. The Antichrist has come to power. And look at what he does in this one world government. And we see that coming to pass very quickly. In Revelation 13, verse 16, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here in Revelation 13, we see another very clear indicator of what it's going to look like in the last lap of time, and you see a global cashless society. I'm going to say that again. You see here a global cashless society. Society. You know, that just kind of goes right over us, doesn't it? You, you don't understand. When I was a teenager, if I stood outside of my grocery store and everybody going by, I said this to them, hey, in about 10 more years, we're going to have a global cashless society. Throw your money away. It's all going to be global, cashless, one world curtain. You know what? They would have put me in the loony bin, figuring I've been reading too many cartoons and sci-fi. Y'all with me? But right now, if you stood in front of your local Walmart, which half a quarter lane visits every day, by the way, I was there today. That's crazy. It's crazy. But you stood there and you said, hey, just want to announce, we're never going to have a global cashless society. We'll always have money. Throw your credit cards away. Not going to happen. I'm going to tell you, they'd throw you in the loony bin right now because we are there. When I was a kid, software wasn't even a word. When I was a kid, credit cards were not even in existence. But today, 
To say, oh, we'll never have a global cashless society. Are you kidding me? We are right there. Fox News 2021 featured a brand new little chip that Sweden came out with. It's a microchip the size of a grain of rice. It goes in the flap of your skin on your right hand. They were very clear. Fox News, this guy promoting it. And on that, you got all the info you need. Vaccination status, bank accounts, medical records, all your financials, credit You put anything you want on that thing. And as people begin to go, oh, you got to be kidding me. You know what that inventor said? He said, whether you like it or not, the future is here. That was three years ago. Major news network. Deb and I came in from overseas last year. I remember standing in line, got our passports, you know, and uh, we're standing in line, and then here it is. It's our turn to step up. So I stepped up to the counter, and uh, I said, here's the passport. Oh, he said, I don't need those. I said, what do you mean you don't need those? You're good. Go ahead. I said, well, how can you do that? Oh, he said, we scanned you, facial recognition. All of that was taken care of while you were standing in line getting ready to come up here. Could I just say tonight... We have everything in place for a global cashless society. And how much sense will it make? You can't lose it. You know what I'm saying? Just plant it in there. There are RF chip and pets all the time now. And babies in Tel Aviv have been RF chip for over 10 years. We're there. And as I look at everything going on, I realize every single tumbler in the combination lock is now lined up just waiting for God to pull the lever for Jesus Christ's return. I called my son Kevin in the midst of the pandemic and he's looking at everything going on and this is what that kid said. He said, Dad, don't get me wrong. I've always believed the book of Revelation would come to pass. But I just never could see how we would get there. But now as I look around at everything going on, the global response by governments, the no cash allowed, and all in lockstep, he said, Dad, I can see how the book of Revelation is going to get fulfilled. You know what that kid was saying in his own way? Dad, we're living in the last lap of time. The return of Christ is so soon. Number one, you and I need to recognize these days are different. We're living in the last lap of time. But here's what's exciting. Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh, which is my second point. Many of us will be leaving. Write that down. Many of us will be leaving in the last lap of time. You know, only the last lap has something no other lap has. Any idea what it is? Only the last lap has it. No other lap has this. What is, what is it that the last half ha, lap has that no other lap has? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Finish line. Write it down. It's got the finish line. Only the last lap has the finish line. And let me just say this. What a finish the children of God and those who belong to Jesus Christ have if we're alive and remain when Jesus Christ returns. Look at me in 1 Thessalonians real quickly and look at this moment as noted. It's referred theologically as the rapture is what it's referred to as. Though the rapture doesn't occur in your Bible, the word rapture means literally the taking away. And by the way, if that bothers you, the word missionary doesn't occur in your Bible either, but we believe in missions, amen? So don't, you know, people have said to me, well, uh, you know, how come the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs? I've heard that one before, because the word never came into uh, being uh, uh, until about 90 years ago. There was no such word as dinosaur, amen? So, wow, that was a freebie. Anyhow, for what it's worth, I just, 1 Thessalonians 4, watch this. Look at this moment. The finish line for a believer when Jesus Christ returns says this, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Notice he's talking to saved people. Concerning them which are asleep, those who died in Jesus. The Bible describes that as simply temporary, like sleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Isn't that good to have God's word on something? We got God's word on this. And what is it? 
that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, it's the return of Jesus Christ, shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's where the word rapture comes from. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he adds these words. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Here we see that moment noted when Jesus Christ returns and the rapture occurs, the catching away of those who are alive and remain. And do you know how fast that occurs? 1 Corinthians tells us that, that moment will occur in the twinkling of an eye. I've explained this before, but I just want to explain it again. In fact, I want to see if anybody remembers the mathematical number. You know, when you hear twinkling of an eye, that's faster than light can bounce off your eyeball. All right? Well, what's the speed of light? Somebody tell me. 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. You got it again, brother. Hey, that means if you took a flashlight tonight and just shined it up there into the sky and turned it on for one second, then shut it off, if unobstructed, that beam would have traveled 186,000 miles. In that one, that's faster than some of you drive. Yeah, that's faster than some of your spouses drive. Barely. You know what that tells me, though? That twinkling of an eye, that moment is faster than the blink of an eye. It's faster than you can blink your eye. Blink. Blink. Amen. It's faster than you can blink your eye. That's the return of Jesus Christ. You ever had a blink of an eye experience? You ever had one of those moments? Oh, I remember mine, my very first one. It was on a Friday. I was junior high, suiting up for a basketball game, and all day long my right side had been bothering me. And as the day wore on, it just got worse and worse until finally I couldn't even walk. And I'm stretched out in the men's locker room. My dad has been called. He's come in to see what's going on. And pushing around and, and prodding, they figured out I had appendicitis. So off to Glencoe Memorial Hospital in Minnesota, Yabetcha, I went. And I remember as they took me in there, and I, I had stitches all over me, but I'd never been under the knife, so to speak. And they began to prep me, get me all ready, and... And I remember the last thing that happened, a little anesthesiologist came over to me. She plugged me in, hung the little flask up there, and this is what she said to me. Now, young David, I'm your anesthesiologist for this operation today. And when I go ahead and put that anesthetic in you, in a matter of seconds, it's going to knock you out. And there'll be nothing you can do to stop the effect of what I'm going to give you. I said, is that right? Oh, that's right, son. You can't stop that. I said, I bet you I could fight it off. She said, you won't be able to. I bet you I can. I said, all right, I'll tell you what. We'll play a little game. I mean, I'm a 13-year-old kid. I remember this like yesterday. She said, when I say go, I want you to start counting out loud from 100 backwards as fast as you can by ones. And she said, I'm going to pull that thing when I say go, and that medication is going to start coming to you. And she said, before you get to 90, it'll knock you out. I said, is that right? She said, that's right. I said, game on. <laughs> she said, all right, here we go. Are you ready? I said, I'm ready. You ready? She said, oh, I've been ready. She said, on your mark, get set, go. And she pulls that. And I begin counting as quickly as I could. 100, 99, 98, 97. And I begin to feel that fluid going into my arm. 96, 94. And between 94, or 95 and 94, boom, I went out. They did their chop suey and sewed me up. And I woke up in another room, dark, elevated bed, doing this 94, 93, 92. Where am I? I mean, just poof, like that. You know, when Jesus Christ returns, Scripture says it's like the lightning from the east to the west. It's the twinkling of an eye. You're here tonight and you're not saved. You say, I'll tell you what, preacher. 
I'll wait till I hear somebody say, okay, here he comes, and then I'll get saved. They're not going to have time to tell you that. They won't have time to warn you. This is your warning. This is your warning. You're here tonight as a believer, and you're not living right. You say, you know what? I know this isn't right. I've struggled, but... But, you know, when I hear Jesus is coming, when I get that sound and I'll, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness, I'll get things right, so I'm not ashamed when I meet him. Hey, hey, you're not going to have time to do that. This is it. Right now. The Roloff girls would sing it so well. It could happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Today's the day. Isn't that interesting how God always said, today's the day of salvation. He doesn't talk about tomorrow. And he doesn't say yesterday because that's gone. Same with the people, all of us that are saved. You have something you're ashamed of now and how you're living. You ought to turn from it. Amen. The king is coming. Everything's in place. He could return before I'm done with this sermon. Ready or not, here he comes. Amen. All of us are living in the last lap. Some of us are going to get to be leaving in the last lap. Wow, that's incredible. But here's the final thought, and write this down on the back. Absolutely none of us needs to be losing in the last lap of time. Write that down. None of you tonight needs to be losing in the last lap of time. Let me address believers first. Christian, Right now, recognize with the return of the Lord so close, you don't need to be losing in this last lap of time. You say, can a Christian lose something? Yes, they can. Listen to Paul speak to the church in Galatia, and he said this, you did run well. You were doing so well, what happened? And I come through churches every couple of years, and there's times where I'll turn to the preacher and say, hey, how's so-and-so doing? He used to sit right there, and the head goes down. He says, you know, he got bitter and upset about something, and he's not going to church anymore. And, 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 and when I hear that, this is what I think. Are you kidding me? Serve for 30 years faithfully. The finish line, you can see the Lord's return right there, and this is how we're going to end the race? Oh, I say, you're kidding me. So close to home. He'll go there, but so close. And we stop serving the Lord. Let's recognize, write these three words I want you to write down because this will be important. Every last lap has the same characteristics. Whether it's a literal lap you run in a race and I'm a distance runner it's an emotional lap or a spiritual lap like what I'm preaching on. Here's the characteristics of every last lap. This one included. Number one, the last lap is always the most exhausting lap you'll ever run. Write that one down. Amen? It's the, it's the exhausting one. Look across America tonight. This is exhausting. I said it earlier. If you can't get male and female right, you're probably not going to get much else right. Amen? Good is being called evil, and evil is being called good, and, and the sin of tolerance is prevalent, and it's like, it's just exhausting. That's what, that's what my brother Ron would say, it's exhausting. Well, that's the last lap. That's the way last laps are. They're exhausting. Number two, write this one down. The last lap is always the most distracting lap. It shouldn't be, but it is. You ever notice when the last lap, if you were outside of a stadium, you wouldn't know it's the last lap because the whole stadium lights up. Everybody's screaming from the sidelines. You know what I'm saying? It's very distracting if you let it. And look across America. There are so many voices crying, political voices crying, moral voices crying. You with me? Religious voices. It's just there's a cacophony of distracting stuff out there. And you say, why so much now? It's the last lap. That's the nature of the last lap. But number three, write this word down. Actually, I have two of them. It's the most intense and painful lap you'll ever run. The last lap is always the most intense and the most painful lap you'll ever run. Could I just remind you tonight, I'm addressing believers first, and then I want to close in a very unique way, but here's, here's what I want to remind you. 
Do you need to recognize tonight believers? Those of us that have been sheltered from a lot of reality in third world countries, many of us, as I spoke to last night, that try to get out of suffering for Jesus at any cost, and that is the American way to do this, do you need to recognize something tonight? As time gets closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, it's not going to be easier to serve him. It's going to get harder and more painful, and it's going to cost you something to stand for Jesus Christ. Amen? I get an amen there? Yes, it is. Don't expect this race to get easier as you get closer to Jesus Christ's return. It's going to cost you something to serve him. And in the midst of all the distraction, the pain, the intensity, and the exhaustion, number one, don't lose your focus. Don't lose your focus. Go to Hebrews with me and look at our focus as believers. Christian, in this last lap of time, don't lose your focus. Look at our focus. It's in Hebrews 12 and verse number 1. Hebrews 12 and verse 1, we tapped this a couple days ago. Listen to what the Lord says in Hebrews 12, 1. He says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That race is a race of service, not salvation. That salvation race already got run 2,000 years ago by Jesus. Amen? If you're looking for something to do to impress God, to bribe your way into his heaven... You're 2,000 years too late. Jesus already ran that one. And he said, it is finished. There's nothing you can do better than what Jesus did to save your soul from hell. Amen? Look and live. Trust him, not you. This is a race of service. He said, look at this. Let us run with patience the race that is said before us. And look at those next three words in verse 2. Say them out loud with me. Looking unto Jesus. Say them again looking unto Jesus. There it is. In this last lap of time, Christian, don't lose your focus. You are to be looking unto Jesus. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say looking unto the government. Amen? Got to get an amen there? I loved watching all you out here last night in the middle of the presidential debate. That was a blessing, amen? I don't know how many churches, if they had a meeting, would be empty, but I was glad ours was overflowing, amen? That was a blessing. You were looking unto Jesus. He doesn't say looking unto the government. He doesn't say looking unto the news. Ooh, got to be careful there. You know, my favorite thing to do for years before smartphones came out is I would buy a USA Today on Monday. I liked USA Today's as we traveled around in our motorhome because they got color in them. You know, Marines and crayons. We like that stuff, you know. And so I would buy a USA Today. I'd grab my Bible and I'd go to a coffee shop, Starbucks, Panera, you know, wh whatever. But I'd go to a, and then I would sit on. And I love reading my Bible in the coffee shops and carrying tracks because it's a target-rich environment to in introduce people to Jesus Christ. And I'm reading my Bible, then I read some of the USA Today. I read my Bible, I read some of the USA Today. And then all of a sudden, that one Monday, this guy walks by with his coffee. He pauses and he looks at my desk. I'd never met him before in my life. He kind of snorts and he says this, that's good news, and pointed to my Bible. And he said, and that's bad news, and pointed to the newspaper, and then just toddled off. I remember when he did that, I thought, well, now that old coot nailed it. Man, it's amazing when I read the Word of God, that good news gives me peace. It, 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 it encourages my heart. I get into the news, and I get wound up, and I get upset, and I get angry. Y'all with me? Could I get a witness? Oh, man. You know, you need to sh shut your smartphone off. I mean, I mean, crazy. This is good news. And to the believer, Jesus is coming again. This world's not my home. Some cults want it. They can have it. I've got something better. It's Jesus in heaven. Amen? And a lot of what's going through our media today is bad news. He doesn't say looking under talk radio. He doesn't say looking under the markets. That's a roller coaster Maalox ride. Amen? 
He doesn't say looking onto Facebook. Could I get an amen there? Drama, drama, drama. Now, my wife has Facebook, but it's a tool, all right? But I'm just saying, I mean, I watch people. They just, that's their life. And they're so happy. <laughs> so it's just like, wow. He says, looking unto Jesus. You, you want to know the test that reveals who you're looking unto? The test that reveals what you're looking unto? In the morning, after you brushed your little toofies, hit the rain room, got your cup of joe ready to go, what's the first thing you reach for? Ah, ha, ha. Do you reach for your smartphone first to see how the markets are doing? You're three hours ahead of the opening bell out here, man. You're three hours behind. You can easily check them. I wonder how my 401K is. Do you reach for the remote to turn the TV on to see the 27th, you know, episode of Bonanza? One lady said, now, I'm not stopping watching Bonanza. I never said you were supposed to. Just read your Bible more than Bonanza. Amen? <laughs> Do you reach for your smartphone to see what's going on politically, where the polls are sitting in the election right now? Or do you reach for the Word of God? Whatever you reach for first, that is what you're living for. That is who you're focusing on. That is what's on your heart. Try it. It works every single time. That's the test. In this last lap of time, Christian, don't lose your focus. You and I are to be looking unto Jesus. Number two, Christian, don't leave your first love. I wrote it in your notes. Don't leave your first love. I've shared this before, but it's such an appropriate illustration. Over a century ago, D.L. Moody and many others went to the gypsy camp to preach to the gypsies and win them to Jesus. One of the men that got saved is a very notable preacher. His name, Gypsy Smith. Late in life, Gypsy was preaching one of his final sermons. And following that message, an elderly man tottered up to him, and this is what he said. Gypsy lived to about the age of 84 or 85. He said, Gypsy, I heard you when you were a young man. And I heard you preach one of your first messages. And your passion for Jesus Christ just lit me up. Your love for him just absolutely strengthened me and encouraged me to serve him. And Gypsy, I came to hear you one last time. And as old men, could I say this? Gypsy, nothing's changed. Your passion for Jesus Christ is unabated. Your love for him is undiminished. And just like that time decades ago when I first heard you, man, my heart was stirred as you preached, and I loved you presenting the Savior and Gypsy. Here was the question. What's your secret to your passion and your love for Jesus Christ? This is what Gypsy said. And the late Alfred Smith wrote a song to honor Gypsy's answer. I heard Alfred sing it shortly before he died. He said this, Sir, I've never lost the wonder of it all. I've never gotten over why he saved me. I've never gotten over all those sins buried in the sea of my God's forgetfulness. I've never gotten over that not only did he save me, but that he, he gave me his kingdom. Sir, he said, I've never lost the wonder of it all. You remember when you were newly saved, you'd made peace with God, and all your filth was forgiven, past, present, future. I remember just reveling in that thought. I was forgiven. I was free. And I had heaven to look forward to and not hell. And I would spend hours reading my Bible. I would fall asleep with my face in my Bible praying. I mean, you remember those honeymoon days? Do you remember them? Could I hear an amen? Oh, man, that was, that was sweet time. 
But you know, somewhere between then and now, you got hurt. This became common knowledge. You begin to grow accustomed to that thought that Jesus saves. And with the trials of life and the struggles of life and the bitterness and all that goes with that and the familiarity. Now when I ask you, are you saved? It's almost this response, yeah, I got saved. It's almost just a box that got checked. When you meet your salvation one day, he's not a program. He's not a process. He's a person. You are going to touch him, handle him, love on him. You are going to worship him, and you will be in awe and wonder that he died for you, and you became joint heirs with him. Shut your electronics off. Get alone in the closet and say, Lord, remind me where you brought me from. Lord, remind me where I should be. Remind me what I deserve, really. Lord, I'm still a dirty, rotten, wicked, filthy sinner. And just remind me that your love is an everlasting love. And when you placed it on me, you made me the apple of a heavenly Father's eye. And your kingdom is guaranteed, and I'm going to join there with you. Lord, just remind me again who I have in you. And help me to be in awe at the thought. You saved me. This last lap of time, don't lose your focus. Don't leave your first love. And Christian, don't forsake your faith. Don't forsake your faith. You say, a Christian can do that? Sure they can. Paul spoke of Demas. And he said, Demas hath forsaken me. You say, well, what would make a Christian forsake the faith? What would cause that? The answer is right in that verse. Having loved this present world. Ah. Here's our dilemma. As I'm winding these thoughts down, believer recognize in America we have a challenge that almost no other country has when it comes to faithfulness to our king, and it's this. Because of all that we have, prosperity and opportunity in America, and it's still there. We become the believers in this world that are not happy with just one heaven. We want two. Like the old candy that would pull your fillings when you bit down on it, we're the now and later crowd. Amen? Yeah, we're glad we got a heaven coming over there, but we want one right now too. And we forget that no man can serve two masters. This earth is going the opposite direction of the kingdom. These horses are not tethered together. They're pulling an opposite way. And you, have, you and I have got to decide to be delayed gratification people that live for the kingdom that's eternal and will never fade. And that's the one that lasts forever. Amen? Don't lose your focus. It's the last lap. Don't leave your first love. He's the best thing that ever happened to you. He really is. And don't forsake your faith for something that will never last this world. And if you're lost, don't lose your soul. Jesus said this, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Your soul is worth more than Bezos' billions. That's why Jesus died. He didn't die for the money. He died for you. He died for you. Don't turn him away. Amen? And as I close, go to 2 Timothy 4. And this is what I want to close with in 2 Timothy 4. Look at what he says here. Paul is getting to the end of life. He knows his departure is imminent. It's as good as if Jesus came back for him. No, this way he's going to be with the Lord. And look at what happens here in 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 6. He writes to, to young Timothy. 
Your pastor spoke of this man. And this is what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 4, numbers, 4, chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. You know what he's saying? Timothy, I'm in my last lap. Very soon I'm going home to be with Jesus. And look at what he does in verse 7. He looks back at his entire Christian life. He sums it up by saying this. I have fought a good fight. That is a military man's statement. Sir, mission accomplished. Aye, aye, sir. I didn't cut and run from the battle. I held my position and occupied. He said, I fought a good fight. Then he said, I finished my course. That's an athlete. He said, I ran it to the tape. I didn't draw up short. Man, I ran it all the way through to the finish line. And then he adds this, I kept the faith. That's a steward that kept what was committed unto him. All of it speaking of his service. Could you say that tonight? Deb and I came into a Christian college graduation. I'll close with this illustration. And as we came in, I do what I always do when I get into those big venues. I go up to the balcony. I love to get up there and just look down at everything down below. And as I'm up there, I'm looking at rows and rows and rows, hundreds of graduates at this big Christian college in America. And one guy just stood out. All these dark-headed kids and blonde and brunette and, you know, and there's this one guy that under the cap and gown is his head of gray hair. I mean, he just stood out like I stuck out like a sore thumb. And I kind of elbowed Deb. I said, look at that old guy. He got in the the wrong line. What in the world is he doing there? I literally said that. You just, you could see him. He was just stood out. Well, you know, during graduations, they always let the salutatorian talk. None of us got to do that. The valedictorian, now we weren't there either. And they pick a few, and of all of them they pick, this this old gray-headed guy was one of the guys. And he came up there and he grabbed the little pulpit and he looked out at everybody in that big auditorium. And he asked, he said this. He said, I would imagine many of you are wondering what a guy my age is doing here graduating with all these young people. As soon as he said that, I looked at Deb. I said, that's what I was wondering. That was it right there. And he said, unlike my classmates, I came to Jesus late in life. In my pride and unbelief, I, I just live this life in my strength. And one day, late in life, I found out Jesus saves, and he saved me. And I've had people say to me, hey, old man, why would you spend all that time, all that money, all that energy? You don't have a lot of life left. And he says, you know, I just look at him and I say this. Well, I guess for me... I do all of it now late in life because it's just all about finishing well. Wow. Man, I heard that. I thought, wow, that's profound. Can you identify with that tonight? I want all of you, just just think back on your Christian life since you've been saved. Has there been a lap you ran you wish you could have a redo? You say, what was I thinking? I I mean, I was doing well, and then I fell out of the way, and I got into sin, I got a bad attitude. I mean, you go back in time. I think every one of us has some regrets. Could I get an amen there? I mean, there's some things in my life I literally wish I had that magic wand to go back and run a different lap. Just, ah, I wish I could do that. But the sands of time only go through the hourglass of life one way. There's no redos. You can't go back. But there's one thing all of us can do right now, no matter who you are. From this moment forward, you can choose to finish well. Amen? Say, what does that mean? It varies for every person. If you're here tonight without Jesus Christ, finishing well is getting saved. Today's the day of salvation. That's the beginning right there. That's finishing well. Get on the winning team. Amen? 
Get those sins forgiven. If you're saved and you're living in sin, finishing well is jettison, man. If you're living in bitterness, finishing well is forgiving. You See, here's what I know. When I said what I said, something went through your mind about finishing. Something went through your mind. Could be an activity you shouldn't be involved in. Could be an attitude you have. Y'all with me? Could be apathy that you've yielded to. Could be too much feeding the flesh. Not, but something went through your mind when I said that. That is where the Spirit of God wants you to meet him tonight. Right there. Right there. You can hide in the crowd, but you'll never hide from God. He knows right where you are. He knows your name. If you're saved, he really knows you. Amen? I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. All of us are living in the last lap. Some of us with great privilege will be leaving in the last lap. None of us needs to be losing in the last lap of time. By his grace, finish well. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As a musician comes, he just plays softly. I want you to just ponder this thought as we close our service out together. And I want to ask you this. What is it tonight God spoke to you about that would be finishing well? What is it? Is it salvation? Is it in the area of sanctification, living a life that wouldn't be in sin but above sin? Is it service? I look through my Bible. Those are the only three categories you'll find, salvation, sanctification, and service. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. What is it? Right where you're sitting, if you're lost, you can get saved. I never prayed a prayer when I got saved. I never went forward at an invitation. The Spirit of God showed me who I was. I deserved hell. My little rope of self-righteousness I'd so carefully threaded and built and put together all my life to keep me out of hell. God lit it on fire and showed me that would never be enough. And dangling for my self-made hope, my righteousness, I looked down in my mind's eye and saw I was going to hell just like anybody else. And in desperation, I almost cried out out loud, but it was like, Lord, what, what option do I have? And then in love, he, he lowered a second rope called the blood of Jesus Christ. Not what I was doing for him, but what he had already done for me. And I'll never forget, clinging to my rope of self-righteousness, I looked across and the blood of Jesus and what God had done for me was just out of reach. It was just out of reach. I couldn't keep holding on to me and try him out. He was forcing me to choose who I would cling to, self or Savior. And in that moment, I looked up at my rope one more time and realized it's on fire. I'm going down. And for the first time in my life, I let loose of my pride. I let loose of my self-righteousness. I let loose of the sin I thought I could never live without. And I jumped across with all my heart. And I grabbed what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago. And I'm here tonight to say this. He held. He held. I remember the peace that flooded my soul. And my faith had found a resting place, not in me anymore, but in what God did for me 2,000 years ago. That is Bible salvation. God never sent Jesus to help you. He sent him to save you. All your hope must rest in him alone. You can't add anything to what he did to make his sacrifice better. It's all Jesus or nothing. Is he your hope? Right now where you're sitting, by your heart, drop the reins and say, Lord, I'm sick of me. I want your son. 
Look and live. Step across. Trust him alone. Christian, got some regrets? You got something you need to just let go of? Right now, drop the reins. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Father, thank you tonight for this thought, for the wonderful promise that your son is coming again. Father, we see from all we look around us in Scripture, his return is so soon. Help all of us to finish well. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. Turn to page 462. You'll have to grab a hymnal for this. And we're going to sing this. And if you'd like to slip out and pray, you're welcome to. But 462, let's sing two or three verses. And then I'm going to have your pastor close us out. You do what God tells you to do. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. Grab a hymnal. Join me. I'll lead this. What a wonderful old hymn. Listen to these words. Join me on the first. 462. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve Thee to the end. Be Thou forever near me, my Master and my friend. I shall not fear the bad. If thou art by my side, nor <clears throat> path away, if thou wilt be my... You come if you need to pray. Listen. Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle those tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. Jesus, draw thou near. And shield my soul on the final verse. You come if you need to pray. Oh, Jesus, thou has promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow. Give me grace to follow. Follow my master. And let's be seated, be in an attitude of prayer. Music's playing softly for just a moment. Some have come. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. To serve thee to the end. I love that second verse. I see the sights that dazzle. Welcome to America. The tempting sounds I hear. Boy, this world draws, doesn't it? And then he adds this. But Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. Amen? Old hymn, Great Truths. Pastor. Amen, brother. I think what we're going to do is we're going to continue to sing. Brother, you have another hymn to sing? I want us to sing and just be, be in a spirit of prayer. I know God's working in hearts. He's dealing with individuals even right now. 
And let's go ahead and uh, we'll sing this hymn. We'll sing it prayerfully. So God work in our hearts. And uh, let's just take a few more minutes. If God's speaking to your heart, just respond to him. I have a sense that God's speaking to some more hearts. And maybe there's a little resistance. Maybe, well, maybe somebody's not thinking about some of the things that we've heard tonight. We are in the last lap. And we need to focus. We can't lose our focus. We don't want to leave our first love. We certainly don't want to lose our faith. So as we sing here, let God continue to speak to hearts. And maybe, maybe just come up and pray. Maybe it's not even something about God speaking to you about. Maybe it's, I need to be praying for somebody. Somebody that God's laid on my heart. Maybe somebody that I need to talk to this next week. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe it's just a good time to talk to the Lord. And so let's go ahead and we'll extend this out just a little as we sing this hymn. Starting in 476 is you're all on the altar. Thank you. 